Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode. Today's topic is something that I've been longing to do. I haven't done a video like this in quite some time, and I know there's a few of you out there who really appreciate this history of cryptocurrency kind of videos, so I'm indulging myself and for you. Even though these videos tend to be my less viewed kind, frankly, I don't care. Uh, so today, sit back and get ready to learn about the history of cryptocurrencies. Before I get into today's video, I have to do a shameless plug for my husband, Toby. He is in a documentary called Magnetic that has been released to Netflix as of today. It's a really beautiful film that features extreme sports and the athletes that perform them. Uh, of course, Nazare Portugal is highlighted as well as a number of other kind of extreme sports. Beautiful scenery, very well done documentary. And if you guys are into that, I highly recommend you check it out. Again, it's called Magnetic on Netflix. So you can't talk about the history of cryptocurrencies without mentioning the cypherpunks. There's even someone I'm going to be talking about that predates the cypherpunks, but before I get ahead of myself, for those of you who want an introduction, a proper introduction to what the cypherpunks are all about, what they represent, what is motivating them for what they are doing, look no further than the writing done by Eric Hughes in 1993 called A Cypherpunks Manifesto. Now I say this because in it, uh, Eric describes the necessity for both the freedom of speech, most importantly, and also the ability to have privacy in order to have an open society in a digital age. Of course, the latter enabling the former, meaning that the privacy is what ultimately allows you to have freedom of speech. Now at the moment, Cryptography is the best tool that we have to enable this sort of communication or transmission of value. And it is this mostly anonymous group of cypherpunks who you and I need to give full credit for developing the tools that enable us to communicate and to transmit value in this private fashion if we so choose. They developed tools like encrypted messaging platforms and and encrypted email, and of course, cryptocurrencies. But you may be asking, but who or what inspired the cypherpunks? Well, look no further than David Chom. He is a pioneering cryptographer to whom we need to thank for developing privacy protocols nearly 40 years ago in the form of blind signatures, something that he developed in 1982. I'm gonna go ahead and read you a quote from David that he wrote in his article for Scientific American back in 1992. Now remember, this is a time where the internet really isn't a big thing yet at all. And this is the kind of foresight that both the cypherpunks and of course, David Chom is exhibiting. Here's the quote. The choice between keeping information in the hands of individuals or of organizations is being made each time any government or business decides to automate another set of transactions. The shape of society in the next century may depend on which approach predominates. So if you take a look at this article that David wrote back in 1992, in addition to its reiteration in the Cypherpunks Manifesto by Eric Hughes in 1993, this whole concept of privacy and control of transactions is really apparent. It is something that the Cypherpunks have really tried their best to protect and to give us tools that gives us the option to protect our privacy online. Now I'm talking about David Chom today about cryptocurrencies because in 1994, two years after that article I just quoted, he released his version of a cryptocurrency called DigiCash. Now despite partnerships with the likes of Deutsche Bank, ING and Visa, and also having interest from the biggest uh, web browser or web provider of the day, Netscape, 
and also Bill Gates of Microsoft, DigiCash just couldn't seem to strike the right deal to keep that momentum going and it didn't quite find success. Maybe this is just an indication of it being too far ahead of its time. So we're gonna keep it moving. Now we're gonna look at a pretty famous and, and public cypherpunk, Nick Zabo. A lot of people think Nick is actually Satoshi Nakamoto and I understand where they're coming from. A lot of different things have attributed to this assumption. Nick Zabo, first of all, he introduced smart contracts back in 1995, over 20 years before they were actually implemented by what we are now seeing with Ethereum and other smart contract platforms. But also because in 2000, 2003, he wrote a paper describing BitGold, which has a lot of similarities to Bitcoin. It described using the consensus algorithm or the consensus model of proof of work. Now it was never implemented and it was for sure a very early or very near predecessor to Bitcoin, which was released in 2009. Remember this was back in 2003. BitGold didn't quite succeed or maybe you know was even implemented because it couldn't address the double spend situation. And Bitcoin, BTC was able to address this problem and provide a solution in the form of block confirmations. Block confirmations means that a transaction isn't considered really valid or probably more accurately they aren't considered secure until a certain number of blocks have been confirmed um, on top of or after that block that the transaction is included in. Basically, the more block confirmations uh, that a transaction has, the more difficult and expensive it is to undo those blocks in order to gain access to the block that has your transaction in it to ultimately allow you to double spend those coins. You pretty much have to have enough, enough computing power to override the entire network to access your Bitcoin and be able to spend them again. It is very incredibly expensive and it requires a whole lot of computing power, especially in today's day and age of Bitcoin. And furthermore, the second that happens, the network, all it has to do is consider that transaction null and void and it was all for nothing. So as you can see, Bitcoin definitely effectively solves this uh, double spend issue. So here is why Bitcoin works. It is and how it is different than David Chom's DigiCash is that it runs on a decentralized network of nodes and miners that work to allow for peer-to-peer -peer transactions that don't require a centralized third party to verify and certify transactions. The decentralized network is what does this. It's also known as Byzantine fault tolerant. Uh, you might hear that word or that phrase floating around there and that is referring to the decentralized network of nodes that come to a consensus in a way that is unbiased. Because it is a public blockchain that is open source, this is what enables the Bitcoin network and any cryptocurrency network that follows those lines to enable for peer-to-peer -peer, across border interaction with the network. That is what allows Bitcoin to cross borders and enable individuals to access financial freedom and easy digital transactions regardless of their ability or inability to obtain a bank account. It's very accurate to say that the necessity for private transactions online, which ultimately enables our freedom of speech and also so our ability to transmit value in a private manner. In addition to the utter failings of the traditional financial system is what led us down what I believe to be this inevitable path towards cryptocurrencies and the freedom that they provide. You may be asking, yeah, cool, Bitcoin exists, but what about the other thousands of cryptocurrencies that exist? Well, my friend, that is the direct result of what we call open sourced software. And the sheer volume of cryptocurrencies that exist, it says two things. It says first, obviously, that it proves that open source software inspires creativity, innovation, and invention. Being able Able to work off ideas from each other, being able to, uh, you know, analyze and find faults in the other platforms so that you might address it in your own, being able to, to collaborate with people across the world
world towards a common goal is very powerful. And the open source philosophy, open source software uh, is something that really facilitates this. But it also means there are a ton of scammers in this cryptocurrency space that are just trying to ride the wave of this new technology and gaining the benefit of it being so early on. And some are quite successful at masquerading around and they are reaping the benefits. Not every cryptocurrency is created equal. And unfortunately, even decent projects that are honest, that are really trying to solve something, aren't guaranteed to survive in this space. Perhaps even more, unfortunately, there is probably a number of scams that will outlive those other like more decent, honest projects. In my own way of contributing towards this cryptocurrency space is to provide videos like these that help you understand why this disruptive technology exists and why we should continue to pursue it in any way that we can. That's gonna wrap it up for today's video. I hope that you enjoyed this. If you have, I appreciate it if you leave a like and hit subscribe if you haven't already to get more videos like this coming to you several times a week. Until then, I'll be seeing you guys on Monday as I go live with Toby at noon Eastern time.